Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we talk all things true crime. So if you are brand new and stopping by for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's video. And if you like this channel and you enjoy hearing what I have to say about these cases, subscribe if you haven't done so already. That way you get notified when I post new videos or when I do live streams, which happens few and far between these days, but when there are real-time case updates that are happening, boom, in the moment, I do try to jump on a live stream. So you will get notified of those as well. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. I hope you guys are having a great day and thanks so much for joining me today. The case we're talking about today is one that, guys, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin with this, honestly. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I debated if I was even going to cover it because as I was going through the affidavit and as I was going through the probable cause warrant, it is upsetting. It's very upsetting. And none of these are easy. We all know that. But this one was particularly rough for me. And as we go through it, you'll understand why. So bear with me, I may need to pause, but I am gonna bring you guys the latest information with this case, and we together are going to try to get justice for this young six-year-old little girl. Garland Grace is 36 years old, and she lives in Seattle with her six-year-old daughter. On March 1st, Garland was arrested after her boyfriend found her six-year-old daughter unresponsive in her apartment. After he found her unresponsive, he called 911. The details that police and health officials were about to learn would absolutely haunt them. The brutality, the deception, and the absolute heartless actions by this mother against her six-year-old daughter would leave everybody completely speechless. So let's get right into it. Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. On March 1st, 2021, the Seattle Fire Department arrived on the scene to an apartment building in Seattle after a 911 call was received stating that there was a six-year-old little girl who was unresponsive. The fire department found that the little girl had a very weak pulse, but luckily she was still breathing. They began trying to resuscitate her and once the little girl became responsive, everybody was about to learn what happened to this innocent child in the first place. After coming to and really getting her bearings, the little girl told authorities that she was hungry. And she says that mommy gives me whoopings and mommy gives me owies. Firefighters told officers that she appeared to be extremely malnourished and also was covered in bruises. The six-year-old told the officers that she had been sleeping in the shower, which she also urinates in and defecates in because she passes out if she stands up. A clear result of the starvation and the malnourishment. It's truly just awful. But even more awful than that, the little girl's mother, Garland, her boyfriend allegedly knew about what was happening and he did nothing to stop it. He never once reported what was happening. He never once tried to intervene until he decided to call 911 on this particular day. He told police that he thinks that the little girl had slept in the shower because she poops and pees everywhere. Um, let me just say, six years old, if they're still unable to control their bladder, generally that falls on the parents, unless they have some sort of medical condition. But it appears to me that the mother obviously didn't try to potty train this little girl or teach her how to control her bladder and relieve herself. And look, I get it. Potty training isn't easy. I'm currently in the middle of it now. It's not fun, but you do it because you are a parent and literally it's what you do as a human being. You don't just stick your six-year-old in the shower like an animal because you're too lazy to teach her how to handle it. So when police arrived to the apartment, Garland and her boyfriend Jamel were standing outside of the apartment complex near an ambulance. Garland told the officer that they had called the fire department because her daughter couldn't walk. She said that a week earlier, her daughter apparently had fallen and hit her head on the way to the grocery store, that she tripped and hit her head on the curb, saying that today she noticed her daughter had swelling and that that fall and hitting the curb must have been the cause of it. Mm-hmm. Sure. Jamel said, too, that he didn't observe the little girl's fall, but that apparently she falls often. Guys, 
Like, how many red flags already are we in? Garland also said that she was the primary caregiver for her six-year-old daughter and that she used to work in a hospital, but now she cares for her daughter 24-7. It's unclear if the reason she is stating that is because her daughter does have some sort of medical condition or if she's saying that she's just a stay-at-home mother. She goes on to say that she hasn't left her daughter with anybody else for over three years. And as for their living arrangements, Garland told police that she and her daughter bounce around between her apartment, her mother's house, and her boyfriend's apartment. But she tells them that they've been at her boyfriend's apartment for the last several weeks. Garland also says that her daughter was taken out of school and homeschooled because she was reportedly drawing too much attention to herself. What does that even mean, drawing too much attention to herself? What attention? Honestly, what does that even mean? And in regards to her weight and the malnourishment allegations, she explains to officers what she feeds her daughter, saying that in the morning, she feeds her oatmeal and raisins. Two hours later, she gives her crackers, carrots, and water. And then two hours after that, she gives her a sandwich and chips. And she says that her daughter eats a lot, every single day, especially at dinner time. And then she says her daughter is just skinny. She's not malnourished at all. Now, when I had first heard these exact words that Garland told officers about the food and her eating habits, what struck me as odd was that it appeared to be very regimented. Not only what she gave her daughter, which Sure, maybe it is the same every single day. Personally, for me, I eat the same thing almost every single day because I am just a creature of habit by nature. And maybe that, you know, maybe you do that with your child as well, whether it's because of financial constraints, their personal taste, what you want them to eat. I don't know. But that wasn't what even caught me off guard. It was that she was so regimented by saying she eats every two hours, as though it's almost as though she was trying to persuade them to believe her and sell them on the idea that her daughter really was eating enough and that it was sufficient, saying every two hours, here's what I give her, here's what I give her, here's what I give her. It just seems odd to me because if somebody were to ask me right now, hey, what did Theo eat yesterday? First of all, I wouldn't know the time. I'd say, well, in the morning he wanted me to make him a waffle, so I I made him two waffles. Then he wanted some blueberries, maybe 30 minutes after that. He went to school, he ate at school, he came home. I don't know exactly what time it was, but he told me he wanted spam and eggs, which is true. My husband got him into that, so I made him that. But I wouldn't have said, then two hours later, I gave him a snack, then this and that. It just struck me as odd, and let me know what you guys think. To me, it did. Maybe I'm crazy. So anyways, when Garland was then shown pictures of her daughter in the hospital after her daughter had been taken away and shown these photos of the condition that her daughter's body was in, Garland began to cry. And she asked to then keep the photos, which I thought was weird. Now, these photos I'm not going to include here, as I had, I think, previously mentioned, because they are extremely graphic and they're very upsetting. She's just a little girl. They're horrible. Take my word for it. They are horrible. So I don't know why her mom said that she wanted to keep the photos unless she was proud of the way she... I don't know. But these pictures, guys, are awful. In addition to the conversations that detectives were having with Garland, they also learned a lot more from Garland's boyfriend, Jamel. They learned that the little six-year-old girl had been sleeping in the shower for the last seven and a half months. He also told police that he watched as Garland was whooping her daughter. And he described the incidents as Garland holding down her daughter and hitting her with a belt or a spatula, usually on her bottom. However, apparently Garland would also hit her elsewhere if the little girl started to squirm. Anybody is going to squirm if they are being hit, especially a six-year-old. So why on earth would he watch that happen and not step in to stop it? He also said that he saw Garland shake her daughter when she would discipline her. He told officers that as a form of punishment, her daughter had food withheld from her, and some days she wouldn't get anything to eat besides crackers and water. And this aligned, unfortunately, with what the little girl confided in officers, because she told them that the last time she ate was when she had Fritos two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, guys. Of course she was malnourished and couldn't stand up on her own. She hasn't had anything to eat in two weeks. The boyfriend told the officers that Garland is a good mom and that he didn't want to get her in trouble, but that ultimately he called 911 because he thought it was the right thing to do. 
Great job, Jamel. Great job. Finally. Yeah, a little too late. And a good mom? No, absolutely not. And what's crazy is he even gives an interview where he sounds absolutely heartbroken over the situation, yet he could have helped at any point. It's unbelievable that I didn't, I didn't actually catch what was going on until the ambulance. So that was, I mean, that was a shocking for me. I, I mean, this is the voice of the man listed in the documents as Grace's boyfriend. He did not want to show his face or to use his name. He tells me the situation is much more complicated between he and Grace. He says she was a friend. They did date in the past and he says he cared for her and her daughter very much but they did not stay with him full time. And he would only see the mom and daughter sporadically a few days a week for a few hours. And that's one thing I was never able to see is no scars or anything. Cause every time she came back around, she's always kept her in long sleeves. And on the date of the incident, he tells me he was talking to Grace's daughter and she seemed off. So I took her to get some cold air. So she was blinking and I kept saying, are you okay? She kept saying, I'm okay, but she wasn't. And then they cut open her, her jacket. When they cut open her jacket, I can see how, like her body was, it seemed like to me like it was like a skeleton, so. He tells me the hardest part is all of this was happening right under his nose. And that's what hurts. That, I couldn't help, that's it. He says that he and Garland were friends and that they did date a little bit. He said he would let her and her young daughter stay with him, but that they didn't stay with him full time, which also aligns with Garland's story earlier when she had told officers that she and her daughter bounced from her own apartment to her mother's house to her boyfriend's apartment. But the boyfriend also says that he had absolutely no idea that the little girl was in that condition. But I find that hard to believe because maybe you didn't know that she was in that exact condition at this moment in time, but you certainly knew that she wasn't in good condition and you certainly knew what was happening so and that she wasn't being well taken care of at all so you don't get a free pass in my eyes detectives also interviewed the little girl's grandmother who said that she hadn't seen her since june of 2020 at her preschool graduation and she says the reason why is because apparently she criticized garland's parenting of the little six-year-old and then garland refused to allow her around now, I'm curious to know as to what she criticized. Did she also witness what was happening and to the extent that it was happening? And if so, why was it not reported if she was so concerned? Children don't have the ability to be a voice for themselves. And it's our responsibility to be that voice for them as adults. And now this is the third person, the third adult who failed this little girl. The third adult who should have known better and should have done better. The little girl was taken to Seattle Children's Hospital for assessment, and physicians noted that there was extensive bruising and skin injuries to her face and to other extremities. There was also fluid buildup in her brain, damage to her respiratory system, a bruise on her left ear, and a back injury. Doctors documented numerous injuries and signs of starvation. They also raised concerns of illicit drug injection because of her mental state when she arrived at the hospital and because doctors found several puncture marks during the physical examination. They are alleging that in addition to the starvation and the hitting that this mother also injected her daughter with drugs. It's absolutely unfathomable. And Garland told investigators that she doesn't abuse drugs or alcohol and that she only smokes cigarettes, which in the toxicology report, it did show high, high levels of nicotine in that six-year-old, which we know she had issues with her respiratory system. So how much secondhand smoke was she breathing in? How much was she taken in, in, to, in addition to everything else and in addition to the alleged drugs that were in her system from the puncture marks, which we're going to talk about more in a few minutes here. So Garland told detectives that her daughter had not been to a doctor in two or three years, and she claimed that all of these injuries on her six-year-old were self-inflicted. I'm sorry, self-inflicted? And when detectives asked her why this little girl would say that the bruises were from her mom hitting her, Garland claimed that her daughter was sneaky and held a grudge against her because she wouldn't let her see her father. Guys, I'm going to just keep waving it because I'm sorry, but as sneaky as a six-year-old might be, I highly, highly doubt 
anyone that age is that calculated as to self-inflict injuries and then try to pin it on their parent. Get real. Get real, Garland. And very quickly, detectives also learned that none of what Garland was saying was true. In fact, medical evidence showed that this six-year-old little girl's injuries amounted to torture and the abuse had been ongoing since at least January of 2019. And the court document said that the constellation of diagnostic findings are highly suggestive of child torture, which involves both physical abuse and psychological maltreatment, often through forms of isolation and starvation. In fact, in the hospital, when this little girl was weighed, she was only in the one percentile for her weight. She also was diagnosed with eight different diagnoses associated with malnourishment. She wasn't just skinny as her mother was trying to claim. Currently, experts from Seattle Children's Hospital are working diligently to revive the little girl from what they describe as near-fatal injuries, injuries that appear to be intentionally and cruelly inflicted by the mother on this little girl. Now, the senior prosecutor on this case said that the six-year-old child in this case has been through unfathomable trauma, and while she has been able to articulate a bit of her abuse, her body is the primary evidence in this case. More horrific are the images of the victim's body that graphically show the resulting injuries of this pattern of torture. It's a direct quote from the King County prosecuting attorney's charging documents. The word torture is mentioned three times throughout these pages, and what is described within this document is nothing short. The document alleges that Garland Grace beat and starved her child. And experts are also concerned the little girl may have been forcefully drugged due to puncture marks found on her body and her altered mental state. The documents say the unfathomable trauma this little girl has been through is evident just by looking at her. It was reported that the little girl appeared to have been healthy up until the time that she was about four and a half years old, but since then that she has been severely malnourished in addition to intentionally physically injured. They also say that due to her mental state when coming into the hospital, the puncture marks near her veins, her appearance, and the fact that this whole thing took place in an area that is known to have high crime rates and high rates of crime regarding SA of children, they wanted to actually raise concern and have an investigation for potential SA and drug facilitated SA, meaning that they believe that Garland may have been selling her daughter and subduing her by injecting her with these illicit drugs. So because of this, they also ordered a SANE exam be performed. Garland was charged with first-degree assault of a child and first-degree criminal mistreatment for the alleged abuse. She's being held on a $500,000 bond and is set to be arraigned on March 16th, literally right now. And in a very interesting turn of events, but I can't quite say that I'm surprised and I'm going to explain why, is yesterday her boyfriend Jamel was also detained and held in custody for criminal mistreatment and assault of a child. Now, criminal mistreatment is when someone causes injury or fails to protect a dependent, which would make sense in this case because the six-year-old is clearly a dependent. And on the court website, it shows that his status is under investigation, not that he has yet formally been charged. And the investigation stage, also known as the pre-charge stage, is really the period in time when a suspect is being investigated for a possible criminal offense, but that there hasn't yet been any formal action taken or no official charges made yet. So even though an individual has yet to face any formal legal action, this stage usually involves being brought in for questioning and then later either being released without any charges or being charged and being booked. So it'll be interesting to see if they do end up charging him as well, in addition to the mother. And in addition to her mother being held accountable, I'm curious if they will end up charging the boyfriend with anything as well, because technically he didn't inflict any of the injuries that we know of, but he was complicit and remained quiet as this was happening for literally years, guys. So maybe there isn't enough evidence for him to be held responsible legally and to legally charge him with anything but it definitely makes him a complete trash human being. And we do know that he's being investigated, so my guess is charges probably will follow soon. 
So I'm curious to know, what do you think about his actions and his desire to protect Garland? Because remember, he told officers that she was a good mom, that he didn't want to call the police, but now he felt it was time. So what do you think about those actions? Because if this does run deeper, and it is facilitated essay, could he have been involved somehow? Or could he have been reaping the financial benefits? And could that be why he stayed quiet for so long? What do you think the truth here is? Please keep this little girl in your prayers as she recovers from this and tries to have some semblance of a normal life with a loving family in the future. And please pray that this monster mother and anybody else who was involved is held accountable so that this sweet, innocent six-year-old gets the justice that she so much deserves. Thanks for tuning in with me, guys. I'm going to keep you updated as we go to the arraignment, as we hear about the boyfriend's charges, and I'll keep you posted on what's going on. And this is just one more glaring reminder to always keep our eyes open and be aware of what's happening next door to us because you never know what's happening in your own backyard. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in with me. Don't forget, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Leave your comments below with what your thoughts are on this case. If you think the boyfriend was also involved in all of this, is this facilitated essay? What or what, did she just get some sort of sick pleasure out of doing this to her daughter? What do you guys think? Leave your comments below and also please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up on your way out. All right guys, thanks again for tuning in and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.